Hello, friends. Good afternoon, and welcome to Florida Supernature. Today's presentation on the life of lichen. I am James Stevenson. I am with the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, Pinellas County Extension. We're a partnership with our local government, providing the citizens some research-based information on how to be good stewards of the bit of the environment that we have uh, purview over. Today, we'll be discussing this incredible creature organism called lichen. And you've probably seen, you might even have heard of lichen, but we're gonna dive into just exactly what is it and how does it work? Now, most people, if they are slightly aware of lichen, would be able to say that yes, it's a combination of two different organisms, a fungus and an algae. And to an extent, that is exactly right. Um, a lichen can be consisted of a fungus, and we're all familiar with toadstools. We know what fungus is, and algae, um, an aquatic plant, an aquatic photosynthetic plant, an algae, so a fungus and an algae. The algae provides sugar alcohols, sugar, glucose, that plants have the magic ability of being able to create from sunlight and carbon dioxide. The fungus provides a support, a place for that algae to live. Um, that's how those two things come together to form uh, a lichen organism. But there are some lichen that are combinations of fungus, like we have our representative fungus here, our toadstool, and bacteria. There are bacteria which belong to a completely different kingdom of life. Uh, they're not plants, they're not animals, they're not fungus, they're bacteria uh, that can photosynthesize. So there are photosynthetic bacteria that can be um, involved in a lichen relationship. So again, the bacteria is photosynthetic. It can produce um, the sugar glucose that the fungus can feed off of, and it can also produce nitrogen, another important nutrient for many living things. Getting a little bit more complicated, a lichen can consist of all three organisms, a fungus, an algae, and a bacteria. So that shows you how diverse this group can be. Um, just, you know, exponentially more diverse depending on the combination of different fungal species, different algae species, and different bacteria species. So let's look at the fungus first. The fungus in a lichen is referred to as the mycobiont. That means the, the fungal part of this living organism, the mycobiont. Now, here I want to pause and just remind you of some, you know, eighth or ninth grade biology. Uh, living organisms are separated into very different kingdoms. And at the very, very, very basic level, uh, they can be broken down into these five basic kingdoms. The bacteria as a very diverse kingdom, and we all know that certain bacteria can cause disease, but they're also very important um, decomposers. We have the protists, perhaps you remember um, the paramecium from school, maybe not. Anyway, these are single-celled organisms that don't that are more complex than bacteria, uh, reproduce themselves usually by budding off. The fungus is a separate kingdom, the plants is a separate kingdom, and the animals. And if you think about the diversity of animals, everything from, say, a flea on your cat to a great blue whale, a little bit of diversity in there, yeah. So all these kingdoms have just about the same amount of diversity amongst the different members of those kingdoms. So just bear that in mind, because what we're talking about today are bacteria in one kingdom, fungus in another kingdom, and plants in another kingdom, all coming together to form these complex organisms known as lichen. Back to the subject of fungus. Fungus, or fungi, are composed of hollow tubes called hyphae. And most fungus that are composed of this hyphae spend the majority of their life cycle out of sight as these closed hollow tubes called hyphae. 
you might have heard that uh, fungus reproduced by spores. And when a spore germinates, it becomes a little germling. Isn't that a cute little word, germling? And then it begins to grow and grow. And as it gets bigger, uh, creates these partitions called septa. Um, and that forms the hyphae. Um, the apical cell here continues to grow in a particular direction. Uh, these hypha can branch and form vast, vast networks of hyphal fibers, hyphae fibers. The way that fungus works is that they digest their environment. Uh, they do not ingest their environment the way that we do when we eat our um, sandwich or salad, we're in ingesting the environment. Uh, the way that fungus works is as the hyphae grows, they can secrete digestive enzymes into their environment, degrade that substrate, that environment, and then reabsorb. So they don't physically eat, they just kind of reabsorb their nutrients that way. And that is how the fungus makes its living by usually inhabiting whatever it is that it is going to be breaking down and ingesting. And you want to get a little bit gross, you can imagine if a fungus were to be a, uh, an animal pathogen, uh, that thing that they live inside and digest and reabsorb would be a living creature. And of course, there are some, we know of some fungal diseases, and that's what's happening. We're being uh, invaded by these uh, mycelia, these a group of hyphae together are referred to as mycelium or as plural mycelia. Uh, those fungal species and many are decomposers of wood. Um, if you find a rotten log, you can often uh, break it apart and find masses of hyphae, uh, these, this network, this vast network of those hollow tubes um, decomposing that wood, rotting that wood down and reabsorbing all the nu nutrients that that tree spent a lifetime uh, locking up into its structure. So that's how the fungus works overall. But I did mention that fungus is a kingdom. And so there are very many different Remember the flea and the great blue whale analogy? Uh, there's lots and lots of variation within the fungal kingdom. And we're probably familiar with the toadstool. If you were to, you know, if somebody were to ask you to draw a fungus, you might draw a toadstool because that's kind of everyone's go-to as, as it were. Uh, but there's a lot of diversity, as I mentioned, in the fungus. Uh, you might also be familiar with the bracket fungus that you might see growing out of a tree, especially a dead tree, uh, bread mold is a fungus that uh, many of us may or may not be familiar with. Um, there's a group called yeast. Uh, maybe you've heard of yeast. Yeast is an incredibly specialized single-celled fungus. These are very highly evolved, if you will. They evolved from much more complicated, like the toadstools and the brackets, uh, but they've foregone this rather garish lifestyle and they're just the single cell. And they bud and they reproduce and they absorb sugars, they feed on sugars in their environment, and of course they release carbon dioxide. And that is why uh, the yeast is so important in bread making. It's what makes the bread rise by its reproduction and respiration. But there's an, another group of fungus that create these little cup structures. And this is a group that are very often lichenized. Uh, the, these cup fungus are very often associated, not always, but often associated in lichen um, organisms. They're referred to as the ascomycetes. Uh, mycete, as you might remember before, the mycobiont, M-Y-C, means uh, fungus. The ASCO refers to this cup-shaped structure. And so here is an ascomycete fungus producing these cup-shaped structures for reproduction only. I do want to mention that the, uh, the part of the fungus that we can actually see these in the case of uh, these, these uh, above ground or sticking out of the side of a tree, this is what happens when the fungus is ready to reproduce all those hyphae, all that mycelium, all those fibers, they begin to knit together into this very solid structure and 
diversify into the various parts, including the structures that are going to produce the spores uh, to reproduce the species. So um, a fungus can live actually for years as mycelium underground or in, a, in the bark of a tree or whatever uh, environment it is digesting. And then only occasionally will those hyphae, that mycelium, will that knit together to form this reproductive structure. So what you see above ground is only the tip of the iceberg. Most of a fungus is hidden within whatever environment it lives in. So this group, the ascomycetes, often in lichen relationships. Is that okay? Can we move on to the algae? I hope everybody's doing well today. The algae, of course, a type of plant, usually aquatic plants. Um, in a lichen organism, they are referred to as the photobiont. Photo uh, for light, biont again for light, life, form because of course the the photobiont is the one that is going to be uh, turning the uh, sunlight the photons into sugar through the magic of plants a one genus of algae that is often lichenized is one called tribugia and that's a green algae you can see the little photosynthetic cells here and these other structures that it kind of forms, these colonies, the Tribugia algae. Another is Trentifolia. Now it's not important to remember these genera, but uh, it's just something that there's only a handful of algae that have found themselves kind of, um, kind of abducted, as it were, into lichenized structures. Both of these genera, Tribugia and Trentifolia, are quite able to live on their own. They are evolved genera with its evolved species that have their own life cycles and, and habitats and way of living. They do not need to be lichenized in order to survive. The fungal component of lichen, however, is unable to survive even in a laboratory without its photobiont. So it begin. It, it kind of takes this from a, um, 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 anyway, it's kind of like the fungus holds the algae hostage, right? Another photobiont, um, the cyanobacteria, which we used to call the blue-green algae. This is, again, remember that kingdom bacteria that is different from plants, it's different from fungus, it's its own thing, but this is another group that has developed the ability to photosynthesize. A bacteria, a photosynthetic bacteria that is also often lichenized is Nostoc, and Nostoc is also perfectly capable of living life on its own outside of a lichenized relationship. It's not symbiosis, the word just came to me. Um, it's more of a, a prison situation where the lichen organism consists of these fungal hyphae. Remember those hollow tubes? This represents those hollow tubes of fungus. They form a nice body layer uh, that can adhere to whatever surface this lichen is going to be growing on. They produce a skin on the surface to prevent uh, drying out. And somewhere in the middle, it keeps its, it kind of imprisons, as it were, its photobionts, either the algae or the bacteria or both. So we have this layer of the photobionts suspended in all that hyphae, uh, thinner on the top to allow, allow for gaseous exchange, thinner on the top to allow for sunlight to penetrate, to activate the, the chloroplasts and get that sugar factory going, and thick enough on the bottom to uh, support the whole structure, the whole organism, and uh, adhere it to whatever surface it's growing on. And I like to kind of heart liken this, I liken this, nice, I kind of compare this um, setup to the setup of a Reese cup. And if we were face to face this afternoon, I would 
at this point hand you a little Reese cup because it, it's kind of mean to show you a Reese cup and not give you one. So forgive me for that. Uh, take a rain check. Come and see us when all this mess is over, and and I'll certainly hook you up with a Reese cup. But again, so we have the the fungal structure supporting that precious layer inside of what, in the case of a lichen, would be the photobionts or the photosynthetic organisms. Now that's the basic basic of lichen. And scientists have been able to pull apart lichen, identify the fungal component, give it a name, identify whatever the photobiont is by growing them separately uh, as long as they can keep the fungus alive, figuring out what kind of fungus it would be if it, if it could live on its own. But there were some mysteries there. Um, oftentimes, the same species of fungus and algae and bacteria would appear in, in lichen that are very different from each other. So look, we've got the same organisms, but when they combine naturally, they become these very, very different things. And it turns out, and it's only been in the past five or 10 years or so, uh, that a fourth member, a fourth component to a lichenized situation has been identified, and it would be a yeast. And this is a picture of those, if you remember, a yeast is another kind of fungus, a very specialized kind of fungus, single cellular, that reproduces by budding. And that the presence or absence of that yeast, whatever genus of yeast, uh, there are yeasts that are, uh, the, there are cup fungus that have formed yeast types, there are those toadstool types that have formed yeast uh, genera as well. So yeast um, across the board can be very, very variable as well. As simple as they are and as specialized as they are, they can exist with very different genetics. And it's the genetics of the yeast that can allow the expression of different species of lichen that previously were thought to consist of just two or maybe three um, different organisms living together. This solved that mystery and why we can have such diversity in lichen. So you've got all this mess going on. You've got fungus, you've got bacteria, you've got yeast, you've got fungus. All, how on earth would you reproduce that? Well, the easiest part would just to be to break into little bits. Um, if you've ever taken a cutting, you know you can grow a whole new plant from just one little piece. Uh, it's the same kind of idea with certain lichen reproduction. Here we have that um, the Reese cup kind of split open on the surface and we've got a little bit of the peanut butter layer and a little bit of the chocolate layer kind of escaping into the environment uh, to establish uh, the fungus would then begin to grow into this phallus, T-H-A-L-L-U-S, which refers to the body of the lichen, um, and the, the little captive uh, photobiont or bionts would then again go through their reproductive phase as well, just splitting in two every couple days or in some cases couple hours uh, to reproduce this species of lichen. Um, it's, a, it's cloning itself, basically, into these little bundles of everything that that uh, parent lichen is composed of. Here's a scanning electron picture of one of those ceridia, those little packages of everything you need to start a new lichen species. Now, the diaspores, the little bundles, they can come from within. In the case of uh, a lichen, forming a structure called a soridium. It's a little nursery area where they can uh, assemble all these pieces and send them out into the atmosphere, or they can exist in these kind of baton-shaped structures that stick up over the surface of the lichen, and they can be brushed off or, or blown off, and, and these diaspores, these little bundles, can be released into the environment that way. Here's a picture that we took here at Brooker of a of a tree trunk that had some of those isidia. You can, I hope you can notice that uh, these little structures are kind of warty, they're kind of wart-like, they kind of stick up. You can see they're even kind of granular because they've got everything they need to reproduce whatever species of, of lichen that would be. Pausing here to say, lichen of course can also form by chance and they must have formed by chance. There's no other way that lichen could have come into existence. So let's say that these, this particular species of fungus within this lichenized 
organism was able to produce a fungal spore, and it can, and release that spore into the atmosphere, which it can do, if that spore were to, by chance, encounter exactly the right species of bacteria, yeast, and algae, a lichen could, uh, could form from that chance encounter. And it has done and it can do again. So as the odds seem so insanely high that that could actually happen, but obviously that's how lichen originally came into existence. So let's look at some lichen biodiversity, some of the different ways that lichen grow and express themselves. And although there's thousands of species of lichen, there's three basic growth forms. And if that's all you learned about lichen today, and if that's all you can take away from today's presentation, that'd be great. You can, you can do a lot of showing off on your next hike if you know these three things, and I hope they're easy enough to remember. Three growth habits. Crustose, folios, and fruticose. And these actually have little clues in a couple of their names. Crustose, you've probably heard the word crust before. It, it's the same. Folios, have you heard of foliage, foliar, having to do with being leaf-like, exactly. And fruticose, I'll give you this one because it's not very, um, obvious. Fruticose in botany means growing like a shrub. So we've got crusty lichen, leafy lichen, and shrubby lichen. Those are three different growth forms that exist throughout the entire diversity of lichenized organisms. Here's an example of a crustose lichen. So this is the trunk of a tree and the lichen looks more or less like it's been painted on. This orange represents the body or the thallus of the lichen. These raised parts are the reproductive structures of a particular type of crustose lichen. So even within those three growth habits, there are different uh, types. This type of crustose lichen is a script lichen. Um, script because it appeared to someone that these little reproductive structures looked like they might be, you know, writing um, something trying to communicate to us. And maybe it is, um, doubtful, but um, so we have this scribbling. So these are referred to as the script lichen. They're quite fun to find. Uh, we've also got another uh, here at Brooker Creek Preserve. We have a popular pink lichen. It catches a lot of people's attention because What's that pink paint doing all the way up in the top of the tree up there? Um, it is a crustose type lichen and it looks as though it, as I said, has been painted on. This is the Christmas lichen. Uh, some people refer to it as Baton Rouge, which means red branch because the presence of this uh, lichen and they can form very large uh, areas of, of, of growth um, makes the branch appear to be red or pink. So Christmas lichen, Baton Rouge, take your pick. No matter what, the scientists refer to it as cryptothecia, which means hidden body, rubrocincta, which means painted red. So there's the Christmas lichen. It is often cited as uh, sensitive to pollution, and lichen has actually been used to do air quality studies. The presence or absence of certain lichen in certain areas, uh, along with other data, can assess the air quality of a particular area. And where you see uh, cryptothecia rubrocincta or whatever else you wanna call it, uh, pretty well, pretty well sh assured that there's clean air around. So breathe deep every time you see the pink lichen on the branches. Of course, it has another name, herpethalon. Don't worry about that, let's, let's, let's move on. Another script lichen, which is another crustose or crust-like or painted on, uh, you get the idea. These are very, very, these are very closely associated with whatever substrate they are growing on. Another point to mention, if you see lichen growing on your patio or if you see lichen growing on your house, 
um, you can attest to the fact that lichen does not derive any nutrient from whatever it's growing on. It's not a parasite. The lichen that grows in the branches of trees is not deriving any nutrient from that tree. It's not causing any damage to that tree whatsoever. It's simply trying to get a place in the sun. The second growth habit, uh, and there are many different types of folios. Remember the leaf-like lichens. Um, this one is one of the ruffle lichens or parmatrema. And if you see, you could get your fingernail in there and, and flick it up like a leaf. Um, Parmatrema, very uh, common up here at Brooker Creek, very common in, in Pinellas County. This one, uh, certain species within this genus can tolerate quite a lot of pollution. So you can find these in town. These are much more likely to be found in town. And they're kind of a bluish gray color. Uh, oftentimes with these strange um, outgrowths on the edges, uh, like eyelashes, we call them. But look, if you look really closely, can you see these little cups? Those are the expression that that's the fungus expressing itself and trying to reproduce itself as a fungus only. Remember the cup shaped fungus in the very beginning? Uh, obviously, there is one of those types of fungus associated in this lichen, and it's produced that same little cup, and it's going to produce just fungal spores um, in the off chance that that spore is going to find whatever else it needs to go into this lichenized um, genus Parmatrema. Another, the Parmelia, another one of the shield lichens. Again, it's leafy. You can see how you can just lift this up on the edge. I hope you can anyway. Uh, I found this one here at Brooker and I was hoping that it would be a type of folios lichen called lungwort because the name is so disgusting and I wanted to say that I'd found a lungwort. Um, could be. If you look, you might be able to see the venation within the thallus of this lichen is kind of like a network, um, like apparently like lungs are inside. So that could be a folios type lichen called lungwort. The third group are the fruticose. Uh, remember that what that means, fruticose? I gave it to you. Did you write it down? It doesn't matter. Fruticose means it grows like a shrub. So this is a terrestrial lichen. Um, it's growing like a shrub on the ground. Um, this one is called deer moss but it's not moss, um, it's a what? What are we talking about here today? Lichen, uh, it's a lichen. It's a three-dimensional shrub-like deer moss. And I thought that um, the deer would use this only as famine food. Further north, this genus Cladonia is called reindeer moss, but of course it would be silly to call this reindeer moss in Florida. Um, and reindeer have been seen, have been known to dig through the snow, find Cladonia, find some of this reindeer moss in their case, and eat it uh, in the middle of winter when there's nothing else. And I made the assumption that uh, our native deer here in Florida would use this organism in the same way as famine food when there's nothing else to eat. Well, there's hardly ever nothing to eat year round in Peninsular Florida is there. Um, but sure enough, one day we were taking a walk and we came around a corner and there was a young deer and he had his head down behind a saw palmetto and he came up and it was just deer moss. All just, all, he was loving it. So apparently it's not famine food for our native deer. British soldiers, uh, it's, I think that's the same slide that I have in my background right now. Uh, this is a fruticose type lichen. So you can see the little stalks. So it's growing on a stalk. And on the top, the reproductive structures, the isidia, uh, they're bright red. Uh, so they're sometimes they, they're little British soldiers with their little red caps. 
Sometimes it's called a match stick lichen because these little stalks that stand up above whatever it's growing on, um, like a match stick, uh, Cladonia cristatella. And this one occurs uh, all across Europe, Asia, and North America. It's everywhere, same species. The beard lichen is Usnea, and Usnea actually means beard. Uh, and look, a cup, these little cups, the fungus is trying to express itself, trying to create uh, reproductive spores to uh, allow the, the fungus to reproduce itself. And in the off chance, again, that it's gonna encounter whatever components it needs to re-lichenize and form that organism anew. So that's a brief life history of these interesting organisms. I hope it's inspired you to go out and look for some of these things. Explain to your friend how they're growing and, and um, pass this knowledge along, uh, especially the part about they're not parasites and they're not doing any damage. Um, if there's a tree that's in decline for whatever reason, a small tree or a large tree that uh, is just getting old and things are starting to wear out, um, the lichen could certainly continue growing because they're, they've got everything they need, but as the tree declines, it might appear that the lichen is taking over. Um, but again, it's not deriving any nutrient from whatever it's growing on. And think about it, if the tree were to fall to the ground and die, that's the end of all the lichen as well. So lichen, not a parasite, uh, not a pathogen, just a hanger on, trying to go through a life cycle and, and make a living. I hope you've enjoyed today's uh, presentation. I'm James Stevenson with the University of IFAS, Pinellas County Extension. If you have any questions or comments or complaints or ways that we could make our presentations better, please don't hesitate to contact me either at the email address uh, right underneath my face or this one here, my pinellascounty.org address. Next week, Florida Supernature will bring you Botanical Science for Beginners. That's quite fun. Uh, it's, we used to call it Botany 101, but I think the word botany scares people. So we added the word beginners. I promise not to scare you off with Botanical Science for Beginners. Uh, the following week, we'll be doing Kitchen Botany here. Same place, same time, um, exploring what you already know about botany through your experiences with salads and cooking and so on. To sign up for the series or, or each uh, class at a time, you probably managed to navigate your way to bit.ly stroke floor FL Supernature. You can keep up with all of our educational opportunities by following us at our Brooker Creek Environmental Education Center Facebook page. Again, thank you for joining us today. I hope to hear from some of you and I hope to see you back here soon. Thanks and have a great afternoon.